Crazy historical battles, mummies, and a witch or two. Yeah, history's wild. There's certainly a lot that we've missed. So we're here to catch you up on the wild stuff. I'm your host, Taylor McWaters, and here are the top 10 most unusual events in history we weren't taught in school. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know, I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also, no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in result, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches, hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. There's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. Feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Malin Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, 
past. But two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god June. No. And they protect women and life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got a Watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird. Almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. With the eyes and the... Huh. Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, Pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan War in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the International Committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a 
off-leash dog park. Because you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells, in total around 1400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks, five people died in total from this retaliation, and it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah. Huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise. My bad. We'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange, my friend. Those were the top 10 unbelievable events in history we weren't taught in school. I hope I've taught you a little something here today. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and I'll see you next time on Bumblebee. Peace.